Rick and Morty's is changing. Kind of. Let me explain. Season 6 is a little over halfway done now, and the hit rate has been staggering. Every episode so far has been pretty good, and some have been great. That's a level of consistency that I don't think we've seen for years. I say this as a guy who really loves some more recent episodes, like The Story Train or Mr. Nimbus, but since maybe Season 3, and definitely since Season 4, well, there's been a lot of good, but there's also been a lot of not good. Dear God, no. You can't be real. Explorer, what is it? What the hell do you see? With season six, though, it really feels like something's shifted. I've seen a lot of people saying it feels like a return to form, and I think that's true, but not just in terms of quality. No, I think that the first half of this sixth season finds Rick and Morty actually tweaking the trajectory of the show, realigning its storytelling, particularly the role Rick plays in a given episode, to a direction typical of the show's earlier seasons. And in this video, we're going to explore how that's being done, and why it's being done now. Boiled down to its most basic form, my take is this. In Season 6, Rick has less control. Rick has less power. Rick doesn't always have the answers. Generally, Rick's been humbled. I think this is a deliberate choice by the writer's room. I think it's visible as a general trend across most of this new material, and I think the result of this trend, broadly, is a reinvigorated Rick and Morty. Time and time again, in this sixth season, Rick's thrown into situations he doesn't have a handle on, or situations where his expertise, intelligence, and stature aren't just guaranteed win conditions. The Night People Revolution, the Fortune 500 Conspiracy, the Dinosaur Theomachy, the Roy World, which will return to you later. Rick's discovering these problems as we do, and scrambling for answers alongside us. And we don't necessarily see this pattern in every episode. Beth's sick twin stink, for instance, is much more focused on the show's non-Rick characters, and even though Rick messes up with the whole portal reset thing in episode 1, he's not exactly thrown for a loop by it, but we do see this dynamic more than we have in years. Now, my take isn't as simple as a humbler Rick, a Rick with less power, less control of the situation, makes for a better episode. That's not what I'm saying. Two of my favourite episodes from season 4, the Vat of Acid episode, and the heist one, sorry, one crew over the Krukus Morty, cast Rick as the puppet master extraordinaire. Hey buddy, how'd it go? I, I don't want to talk about it. It's right, you little bitch. It's the prestige. You prestige Rick, yourself. Rick, how many did I you kill? You tell me, Morty. In both of these cases, Rick's total control of the situation was a big reveal, a revelation which flipped the stories on their heads, so they're not exactly standard examples, but they do go to show that in certain stories, this character can work really well when placed firmly in the driver's seat. And there are plenty of episodes I like where Rick's just kind of straightforwardly powerful and in control without it being some big twist, but it is a dynamic which gets old kind of quick, and one that really wasn't there from the start. We're gonna be holy crap, Morty, run! Morty, run! I've never seen that thing before in my life, Morty! I don't know what the hell it is! Well, we gotta get out of here, Morty! It's gonna kill us! And sure, that's the pilot. Early installment weirdness and all that, but it didn't go away after then, not for a good while. A lot of season one saw Rick just making plans up as he went along. That's it, Morty! Prolonging the inevitable! Listen, if we go into Mrs. Pancake's stream, everything will go 100 times slower, Morty. That'll buy us some time to figure this out. Things tend to work out for him, sure, but there's chaos and uncertainty here. Rick and Morty are underdogs, in nuts situations, faced by unknown threats, and most of the time they just about eke out the W by virtue of Rick's quick wits. But he's wrong a lot. There we go, Summer. Hey, hey, brother. Hey, 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 bro. Nice racket you got going on here. Oh, I get it. The old behind every great man Amazon twist. Some of the show's best episodes rely on Rick's ignorance and fallibility. Total Rickle springs to mind. The whole parasite mess was caused by Rick's negligence, and the situation worsens in the rapid and entertaining way that it does, due in large part to Rick's errors, not merely those of his family. He only stumbles inadvertently into the solution. Pull the trigger! Do it! Do it, mother! Pull the trigger!
Look at Rick Potion number 9, practically an entire episode dedicated to showcasing that sometimes, Rick's science was a sloppy mess with utterly disastrous consequences. Or look at the Ricks Must Be Crazy, where he gets himself and his grandkids into a big old jam because while he'd created a microverse battery, he hadn't accounted for the possibility of that microverse creating its own battery. The first Citadel episode in Season 1 sees our hero taken completely aback by the interdimensional conspiracy targeting him. He's on the lam for the whole episode until he just about clears his name, but even in doing so, he gets captured and misses the real villain. And also, he does all this without the blasé detachment which characterized Season 5 Rick's response to a similar situation. Fine, I could eat, but the second he reveals he's evil, we're gone. I could go on, for a while, but I think you get my point. Make no mistake, this more out of control character is the original Rick. The character originated, after all, as a copyright safe adult spin on Back to the Future's Doc Brown, who, like Season 1 Sanchez, was a great mind, an adventurous one, but wasn't totally knowledgeable or totally capable, and who rarely had his shit together, to use the show's parlance. Get your shit together! Get it all together and put it in a backpack! All your shit! So it's together! Get your shit together! Like the Rick of the first few episodes, Doc Brown mostly operated on the back foot, but that's kind of where the fun lay. Seeing that mad, demented, brilliant mind facing these crazy situations and figuring out a resolution. It's hard. Victory isn't served on a silver platter. It's fought for, won. And yeah, I'm well aware that the origins of Rick Sanchez in that Doc and Marty project were less than serious, but I think it's plain to see that at the beginning of Rick and Morty proper, this Doc Brown derived dynamic was a foundation the show built upon. As Rick and Morty grew, as it continued carving out its own identity, this dynamic would evolve into something less straightforward. Rick grew more and more powerful, prepared, knowledgeable, and unflappable. Until sometime around the third season, and definitely by the fourth, he sort of had an answer for everything. With this Rick, new, ostensibly unknown surroundings or situations kind of ceased to pose any threat. When he found himself in unfamiliar situations, even totally alien ones, which would seem to throw a wrench in his normal process of problem solving, he was never on the back foot for long at all. Bump into a race of subterranean horse people, for instance? No worries, Rick's already intimately familiar with them. Take Claw and Horde, a special victims, Morty. Jesus, guys, you're killing me with these titles. In that episode, Rick, a man for whom science and logic are the ultimate truth, gets thrown into a world where magic is real and where science doesn't seem to work. You might think this would be a problem for him, but it isn't really, he just sciences the magic in like a couple of minutes. Or previously, it was possible Rick could get physically threatened or overpowered. Not anymore though, he's just like a nigh unkillable cyborg with a level of robotic augmentation that would make Adam Jensen jealous. Even when placed in the form of an entirely inert vegetable, he's able to go from pickle to John Wickle in, what, a couple of hours? He became almost godlike. Look, I'm not going to dwell on this because I'm pretty sure others have, but while plenty of episodes found ways to make this new dynamic interesting, some didn't. And again, if you want to hear more about that, how the show's middle years may have been harmed in some ways by this, Rick's quasi-divinity, I get the impression there's plenty of video essays tackling precisely that, but I don't want to get bogged down in those details. I want to flip back to season 6 and take a look at how the show tweaked this, because in many ways Rick is still this near-godly figure. He's still got that instant arsenal of total destruction. He's still able to accomplish pretty much anything the story demands, and it's rare to see anything properly phase him. But in some ways, he isn't this god anymore. Or at least, the Rick and Morty team have been emphasizing this aspect of his character less and less. With the Knight family, Rick can't just solve that problem. It's Jerry's more human side that gives the Smiths an out, and it's pretty much a whole day family effort to escape the Knight family's clutches. The Knight family's trying to make us go back home! You gotta turn around! And sure, even that doesn't totally pay off, but when the Night People leave for good, it isn't just because Rick made them. They were a threat which posed a real problem to him, and ergo to the rest of our cast, one he couldn't just zap away, one his scientific and interstellar problem-solving skills couldn't just shut down. Similarly, while Rick's not powerless in the face of the glitched-out Roy game, while he makes a plan to save Morty, and while his knowledge and logic are helpful here, this is a new situation for him, and he isn't able 
to just make it his bitch in a couple of minutes, like he did in Dragon Episode Fantasyland, or with the snake time travel stuff. No, even when he eventually gets a handle on this new reality, he messes it up. Rick fails horribly because of his own inadequacies. Rick! I'll get every single part of me to get on every ship and go with you. Good. But you have to tell us you love us. Screw you, wait for it. Holy war, holy war, holiest war ever. Through his inability to tell these shards of his grandson that he loves him, or them, I guess, Rick ruins the rescue op and ends up leaving behind way more of Morty's psyche than he could have done. I want to linger on this moment for a little longer though, because I think we can make a pretty telling comparison to the Rick of season three, particularly the Rick we see in that season's finale, because both of these episodes have Rick sort of emotionally damage a family member in a way that kind of messes things up for him, but I think there's an important distinction in how these happen. Season three, episode 10, the Rick Jury and Morty date, sees Sanchez trying to get one over on the president. It's an ego thing, but in trying to win the pickle Rick measuring contest, Test, we see Rick go full OP. Arrest them. Son, you have a right to refuse his order, and I guarantee you're gonna die if you touch me, and there's no afterlife. Everything just goes black. Don't do it. This is Rick the God. Any sort of nonsense he can dream of, he can make. He can even just instantly smite his foes. But that episode ends with none of that mattering, because by virtue of being preoccupied with this ego stroking in this episode and just generally, Rick hadn't noticed the family catastrophe he'd inadvertently created with the whole Beth cloning stuff. Rick, did you tell my mom she might be a clone? No, I, I told her she wasn't. Well, isn't that what you'd tell a clone? Oh, for Christ's sake. The point here seems to be, sure, Rick can be a god, can do anything, can invent anything, can stand up to anyone. But in doing so, in placing his focus on this aspect of his existence, on trying to climb a couple of rungs higher on that metaphysical ladder, he's made himself oblivious to what actually matters. And only when it's nearly too late does he even realize this. When he finally sees this, the whole ego-stroking president-dunking project of artificial divinity comes crashing down. It's a similar deal a few episodes earlier in Pickle Rick. Rick spends that episode trying to assert control onto the universe, instead of going to family therapy. It works, but unbeknownst to him, this avoidance only makes his family's emotional issues worse. Why do we think Grandpa turned himself into a pickle? Surprise, surprise, that does eventually come back to bite him. Now, in both these cases, you could argue that Rick is aware on some level that by chasing this personal actualization, he's ignoring important family issues. But I think it's fair to say that season three Rick exacerbates these emotional problems, makes his family unhappy, because he's choosing to be this scientific ubermensch first and foremost. It's his perhaps faulty process of prioritization that leads to these issues cropping up and him not noticing them in time. When he finally does have to contend with this family drama, it's made more painful and tricky for him because he'd put this other side of himself first. But when he finally gets his priorities in order and wades into the mess, he doesn't fail completely. Maybe he takes an L or two as these conflicts are resolved, but they are resolved. The idea season three seems to be exploring here then is that yes, maybe Rick can be a god of sorts. But pursuing that path means neglecting the one thing that might be more important to him deep down, his family. He can commit himself to this godhood, or he can commit himself to his family, but he can't do both, not fully. I think that's the central tension here. But that isn't the case in season six. It isn't like the Rick Jury and Morty date, in that Rick's prioritization led to him missing a problem until it was too late. It isn't that he's ricking around and the big ego, all that quasi-divinity, has meant that he's lost track of his familial bonds. No, this is a far more direct failing, with none of these caveats or ambiguities. When asked, point blank, to express love, he cannot do it. There's none of that God versus man tension we perhaps saw in season three. No, he went into this machine for the sole purpose of rescuing Morty, and yet he can't say he loves the kid. This naked failing, then, leads to the rest of the episode's conflict and the mixed bag of an ending we saw. Rick didn't even succeed here, not fully. Like the Night People episode, this is a situation Rick stumbled into that isn't immediately known to him, that poses genuine problems. And seeing him struggle, seeing him on the back foot, that makes for a good viewing experience. Even later in the season, when we do see a bit more OP Rick, perhaps closer to the unstoppable know-it-all we discussed above, 
It's never a cakewalk for him. He never starts with all the knowledge or all the tools. Take the fortune cookie episode. Sure, he's got all manner of magic science doodars. Sure, he goes sicko mode on the Panda Express guys, or Rico mode, I guess. Sure, when they discover the fate alien, he's able to figure out a way to get the dub in the following shoot up. But it's all a process, a journey, one we're on alongside Rick, and one which takes the whole episode to play out. He doesn't know how it is that Jerry's fate has been altered, or who's behind it. This has him kind of thrown. Again, he's on the back foot here for most of the episode. So even though he's got all his lasers and gizmos, this feels like classic Rick and Morty in the best way. Similarly, the return of the dinosaurs takes Rick by surprise just as much as it does us. And while we get a decent sized scoop of the unthinkably advanced Rick this episode, it's counterbalanced by the similarly ascended dinos. Rick's gotta take Morty sleuthing across the universe to eventually get one over on these guys. And even then, the conflict takes a good deal more resolving. And I'm sure there's a few exceptions to the pattern I've laid out here, either in season 6 or beforehand, but I'm talking about trends here. The wider, more general way that this show has understood Rick and Rick's role in a story across various points in its existence. So there's always going to be some exception, but I think most of you will agree that by and large, shifts like the ones I'm describing have taken place. So what's with this one? The way season 6 seems to be reshuffling the deck just a little. Well, I think it's worth thinking back to where we left off last year, the season 5 finale. Evil Morty, the central finite curve, all that good stuff. I've noted this before in a video from back around the time that finale aired, but in a lot of ways, that episode very consciously gestured toward wiping the show's slate clean, revamping the setting, relaunching Rick and Morty in a sense. New possibilities beyond the multiverse we'd seen so far were placed on the table, but we've not seen anything beyond the central finite curve so far because Rick's portals have been out of action. Until now, that is. Hoo-ha! Check it out, a dimension where hats wear people! Hmm. Oh, I did it! I fixed portal travel! <laughs> Portals are back. Everything's on the table now for the rest of season 6 and the four or so more seasons thereafter. Why the delay though? Why the pause? Well, given the shift in writing sensibility we've seen throughout season 6 so far, I wonder if the decision to have this little pod of episodes, this cluster of relatively self-contained stories, is supposed to be a pit stop of sorts before we really get going with the second half of Rick and Morty's 10 season run. Because in-universe, the temporary removal of the portal gun isn't some nerf that's cut Rick back down to size, not really. That hasn't really been a major factor in any of these episodes. No, I think it's a symbolic gesture. It's more that Rick's place in the world, in the story, has been altered just a little in these new episodes. He's faced some real issues, made some real mistakes, and been made to really struggle again. This pod of episodes, the first half and a bit of season 6, has humbled Rick Sanchez. Not massively, but just enough that Rick and Morty kind of seem like the underdogs again in a crazy, chaotic cosmos. And I think that's one of the reasons that season 6 has been received so well. That's the pillar of garbage take, anyway. I'd love to know how you felt about it. There's more to it than we've discussed here, of course. For instance, what effect does cutting Rick down to size have on the famed Harmon story circle at the center of each episode's narrative? I don't believe anyone else has answered that question yet, but I think it's certainly an interesting one. It's something I could take a look at if this video does well, I guess. Also, I'm sorry if the audio sounds a bit off today. I've recently moved into a new place and I haven't quite figured out the acoustics properly. It's something I'm working on so hopefully it won't last forever. Make sure you give this video a big ol' like before you go though, and thanks as always to my Patreon backers for supporting what I do, especially Jonathan Francis Bond, Kevin Douglas, Ian Fifield, and Strange Folk. And P.S. If you've ever thought about signing up to the channel Patreon, now's a good time. There's a new exclusive video coming out over there in a few days. Cheers for watching though, and take care.